Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of The New York Times. Welcome to Collaborators and Over the Top Filmmaking. We're delighted to have such innovative and popular filmmakers with us tonight. As soon as we announced it, this Times Talk event immediately sold out. And no wonder. To paraphrase our moderator's profile of one of our guests, they are, quote, walking, talking proof that you can violate the rules and flourish in Hollywood. You will hear much more about our special guests from our moderator, a respected journalist who is one of many reasons why these times demand the times. As the editor-at-large of the Times Magazine and our T-Style magazines, she's known for identifying the most important people and trends in the world of entertainment. Most of all, she has the special ability to write about what it's like to sit in a dark theater mesmerized by film. Please join me in welcoming New York Times Magazine editor-at-large Lynn Hirschberg and our special guests, Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. These are two of the best directors in the world ever. <laughs> My face is crimson. <laughs> On a very personal note, I met Quentin Tarantino the first time when, right before Pulp Fiction, and it was one of those experiences where, as a journalist, they say, you know, you should go meet this director or whatever, and I thought, you know, I've seen Reservoir Dogs, it's good, but... I went on the set of Pulp Fiction and it was like a window opened. I mean, there's something about Quentin and Quentin's perspective that is unlike anybody else's. And Pulp Fiction itself, I think, really changed films. And the same thing with Robert Rodriguez. The things that he's done from the time that he was in, I, I believe you were a medical, I believe you were in like a uh, program, a medical program as yes. a uh, guinea pig. I still and do you some were... outpatient visits from there. <laughs> I mean, he writes, he directs, he, he, he edits the movies, he does the music, and he apparently does the catering on all, <laughs> <laughs> and all, on all of his films. And they also do something that's even more amazing, which is that they're really, truly friends. And they've now done this movie, Planet Terror. And Death Proof. And Death Proof, which together is Grindhouse. <laughs> So let's start with talking about what it is that makes you so interested in Grindhouse. What, I think most people don't actually know what a Grindhouse film was or what the theaters were like. Well, uh, I think it's a variety term, if I'm not mistaken, that um, basically referred to uh, the old theaters that were like in the uh, like in the, the big cities of, uh, of the, the big cities inside of the big cities. All right, Kansas City, New York, Detroit, Los Angeles. <laughs> Is that it's me talking. or is that somebody at the... We're in a grindhouse. Yeah, we're in a grindhouse. <laughs> uh, and they sound, sound something like that. Kind All of right. a grindhouse um, moment. <laughs> um, and so what they would do is... Uh, now, some of these, they were old dilapidated theaters, but some of them, they could have been like, say, the big vaudeville house in 1910. Or they, maybe Birth of a Nation, when they opened in that city, played there. But now it's 1978, and that's 1985, and they're showing... Missing in Action 2, the beginning, you know, with Spanish subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> and rats are running around like crazy, having their way, and paint is peeling off the floor, and there's graffiti on the screen that will be there for the, forever. <laughs> <laughs> and it's never such a problem until there's a, you know, a more white, -y, white scene, and then all of a sudden, you're like, Cholo loves cowboy. <laughs> 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 Uh, but the thing about it, though, is like they show double features or sometimes triple features. And you'd go and you'd see them. And, and what they showed is that the t at, in those days, an exploitation movie, uh, I mean, it really was a different world. Because now you make 2,000 prints or 3,000 prints and you open it all in one weekend all over America and Canada all at the same time. There, you know, an exploitation company, they might make four prints. And they open it in Chattanooga. Right. All right. And then from there, you take it to Memphis. And from there, you go to Little Rock. And then, like, over the course of a year, <clears throat> they'd make that one week circuit. I mean, unless there were houses, the, the houses were great, then maybe they stay for two weeks. Then, uh, so the, 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 the films would get those films as they came in. They'd also get any random kung fu movie or black exploitation movie or sex exploitation movie that the exchange houses had. But they also showed the big movies on their way out of town just before they stopped at Super 8. All right. There wasn't video then, so like you know, you'd see 
Star is Born could be playing with they call her one eye. But it's like Star is Born has been, has been playing for a year and a half by that time. It's, it's last week before it goes to the Kmart Super 8 section. <laughs> so those are the grindhouses. So did you have like a collective unconscious moment where you were at one grindhouse and you were at another grindhouse and you'd seen the same double bill or the triple bill? Well, I'm going to speak for Robert here, but the idea kind of was out of Texas. <laughs> uh, we've been... We've been talking for each other for like three weeks now, all right? He uh, says my answers and I say his. His answers. <laughs> yeah, actually, he, all, all those stories are like, well, then Quentin said, blah, blah, blah. Well, then Robert said. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm from, I'm from Los Angeles, so I was in the big towns and everything. Robert's from Texas. So the other t turn of that coin was drive-ins. Right. Drive-ins got the same thing. The grindhouses, that was a very, that was an urban experience. The drive-ins were, was all about the South and uh, the Midwest. Yeah. So I would be at a drive-in scene with my family. I, from a family of 10 kids, my mom would take us in the van, you know, for the bargain van price. And uh, we're not supposed to get up on the top of the van and look at the other screens because there's like six others. We promised we wouldn't. <laughs> we'd be there watching a Doug McClure double feature or something, and we'd look over, and there's the chest burster coming out of an alien. And, <laughs> Somebody on a phone with a boob next to him and boob tube. You know, we, as we were driving up, we'd look at the titles and go, boob tube, alien. Okay, we're going to try to watch those. And, uh, and that's Nine and a half weeks is the, to the left. <laughs> okay, we're watching that. But no sound, and so you kind of made up your own dialogue. But, um, but no, I, I got, Quentin actually went to all these grindhouse theaters and saw a lot of these movies growing up. But over the past, you know, 12, 14 years we've yeah. known each other, he's been a film print collector. And so he's shown me a lot of these that either he grew up with or that he's discovered along the way. And uh, in his collection, we would sit and watch double features and he would always program it with uh, trailers in between from other movies of that era. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of got up to speed over the, you know, over the past decade just on uh, a lot of the movies that he loves and, and has discovered. And it just kind of sunk in. So we've kind of done it. And you were at his house and you saw a poster of a double bill. Oh, well, what happened was I had done a movie, a 3D movie, a few years back, back when, you know, 3D hadn't been around in two decades. And uh, I thought, that was a, that's a really cool idea no one's done in a while. And I can really do it up digital. There's a new way to do it. And I did it, and it brought 3D back in a way. It did really well for the Spy Kid movies, and now people are regularly churning out 3D movies. And so I thought, well, what else is a old-time theatrical movie-going experience like that, old-fashioned that people don't get to see. And it was the double feature. So about three years ago, I thought about doing a double feature. Myself, I was going to direct both of them. And one of them was going to be Planet Terror. And uh, I was really excited about that. I made up a new company name and started doing posters. And as, as inspiration, I used this double bill poster from the AIP era of Drag Strip Girl and Rock All Night that I got off eBay. You can find it on eBay. It's a reprint. It's like five bucks. And so Rock I was checking Rock All Night and Drag Strip Girl. Drag Strip Girl. And Rock I All Night directed by uh, Roger, Roger Corman, written by Charles B. Griffith. Okay. Who wrote uh, Death Race 2000. Yes. See, I have learned over the past 10 years. <laughs> and Drag Strip Girl, is it good? A uh, director was very good. Face Spain, John Ashley, Frank okay. Gorshin. Very nice. <laughs> and, um, so I, I was, worked for Frank Gorshin. Actually. I had that poster on my floor for a long time. I was using it as inspiration. I kind of put that idea aside, went and did Sin City. And when I went to, Sin, to show great. him... We can clap for Sin City. Sin City. Oh. <laughs> Amazing movie. Little black and white home movie I did back at home. <laughs> I uh, went over to his house to show him the scene that I edited that he had directed for Sin City, because uh, we were almost done. This was about January of 2005. And uh, I'm walking into his house, and his house is just film prints and crap all over the floor, just to get to his couch, you know, your cinematic landmine. <laughs> so then uh, I see on the floor is the drag strip girl Rock All Night poster, the same one that I have. And I said, I got that exact same poster. And it's on the floor, too, at my house. <laughs> and I thought about it. I said, wait, wait, I had an idea years ago. That's right, two double. F you should do one, and I'll do the other. We should do a double feature. He goes, oh, I love double features. We've got to call it Grindhouse. We have to call it Grindhouse. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and it was like that quick. You know, we started throwing all these ideas out within five minutes. And as we were even speaking, I thought, when we make the movie, I can already see us recounting this tale because it was so concise uh -huh. and so fully formed in our minds because it had happened over the past 10 years. We kind of just 
it came out almost fully formed because we'd just been living it that long. It just took a little spark to get it going. And I remember we got so excited about it. I was like, oh, well, should we go ahead and finish watching Sin City now? I guess yeah. we, that's the, the, the business at hand. But we already knew this was going to be our next movie because we were so excited about it. You just got a lot back then. I remember, I mean, and I'm not even down on the multiplexes, but the thing about it was, you know, in New York, there is, you know, there's like, what, two single theaters out there that give you that full experience. And, um... That's a goddamn shame. I mean, it's more than a shame. It's, it's a fucking tragedy, if you ask me. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, though, it, True. it is, you know, you, you'd go to these big theaters and there'd be these huge posters take up over a whole wall. You'd have a marquee with a, you know, a, a painting of the movie of the poster or Elvis or whatever the hell it was, all right, going 20 feet into the air over the marquee and a sets of lobby cards laid all over everything and you had two movies with like kick ass trailers and a cartoon and all that stuff. Now let's, now let's bring it down to today. <laughs> You're renting a seat and that's it. And you gotta get the fuck up out of there, all right, when the movie's <laughs> over. <laughs> and you gotta watch commercials in front of the fucking shit, all right? <laughs> but you know, <laughs> which all bespoke a need <laughs> that we are trying to fulfill. Because the thing about it is, look, you take Planet Terror out of Grindhouse, it's gotta work as a movie. Yeah. You take Death Proof out of Grindhouse, it's gotta work as a movie. That is being said al already. But now you put them together, and now they're, it's bigger than a sum of their parts. This is about the Grindhouse experience from beginning to end that we're trying to capture. And as good, as proud as we are of the movies, we're equally proud that if we did it right, it's a ride. Yeah, it's absolutely. not just watching a movie, it's a ride. But I think separately they actually work beautifully as movies too. Oh, and we're proud of, yeah, we're, no, uh, in a weird way, that we know. Yeah. Okay. Was the no, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, but this grindhouse experience—that's the tangible thing that we had no predecessor other than me Except programming right. movies. But I think, in a way, that's the thing that takes it a step further because, even though you loved—I'm now going to say something probably sacrilegious to you guys—even though you loved those movies that were in mm -hmm. the grindhouse of your, right. I would argue that these are better films. So that than was the idea. I mean, a lot of those things were made by two different people. There was the people actually making the movie, and then there's the people selling the movie. The people right. selling the movie made these great posters that promised all kinds of things that the movie never delivered. Well, or right. sometimes they would deliver something else. So they would actually make a poster that said, you know, sex and drugs or whatever, and mm -hmm. then there would be... A uh, father-son relationship. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Badly done, you know. Okay. And uh, it would be, uh, but that's what they would do. They go, well, this movie ain't gonna get asses and seats, but this poster will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll the other we'll thing make that I love seat. is that also that you know, as it made its way across the country, if there was a sexy part or there was some part oh, that yeah. a particular projectionist liked, they would snip it out. They would oh, take oh, it yeah. home. Yeah. They would take it home for their own view. Oh yeah. So yeah, you never knew what was gonna happen because yeah, all of a sudden you know there'd be all these jump cuts in the sex scenes because you know the projectionist. <laughs> 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 I like Robert the way Bush. I'm taking that home with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can appreciate that, actually. But, uh, <laughs> A lot of Pam Greer in people's yeah. homes. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but at the same but time... But you guys actually were a little withholding, too, which is... Yeah. You know, well, well, we cut that stuff out often. I know. You were good boys and kept it at home. But, you know, there is, like, there is a tip of the hat even to that. Like, for instance, Planet Terror. They have missing reels, is right. what I'm trying to say. Okay, we call you Pla Planet Chair. Well, it's Earth, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it sounded like a big title, you know? I thought, this is what they would have done back then. Make people think they're going to go see a movie set in space or on another planet. It's like right. Earth. Earl, Earth is planetary. It just, you can already increase. <laughs> I, I pointed out the other night. But it's a particular said, corner of Earth that seems to be... One line of dialogue, you know, adds a whole its production value. I have one of the characters go, it's below our feet, 10 stories down. Now, you never see those 10 stories. Yeah, right. They just actually just allude to the fact that you have a bigger budget than you actually do. So a lot of yeah. it's just <laughs> trickery and showmanship, and, and so when you were de when you in that you know momentous epiphany where you decided to make the film, did you decide at that moment what kind of genre you were going to embrace? Is, yeah, yeah it, you know we. Uh, because you, know, you had thought the, of this movie years ago. I actually thought of actually using Planet Terror, but yes. I was going to pair it with something actually pretty close to what we ended up doing with a thriller. But Quentin said, because uh, I said, well, what kind of double feature, because I was just cleaning this slate, what kind of double feature should we make? We can do 
any number of things, and he said, I think we should do horror genre first. Yeah. What was the reason for that? Well, you know, well, it was just it was just the idea that, about the fact that like the, the you know the, kind of the world opens up. What makes what you know what actually I left out the introduction. What makes grindhouses grindhouses were the very you know, particular subgenres that they were right. dealing with, whether it be sex exploitation cheerleader movies or three nurses movies, or if it was kung fu or whatever. So it was the, the whole world was open up to us. But our big thing about it was normally they wouldn't put two like minded horror films together. One would be more monster oriented, you know, like vampires or werewolves or a big creature. And then uh, <laughs> another one would be more terror oriented, you know, a guy stalking a babysitter, or a guy killing nurses, something like that. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so that was what we decided to do on it, on it. And so literally it was a situation where it was like, Roberts is a horror film because it couldn't happen. Mine's a terror movie because it could happen. We like dealing in genre, but we're dealing, we're doing our own cockamamie versions. Completely. Of the movies, all right? And which is the way we want it. But at the same time. There's there no genre movie with that dialogue, and there's no genre movie <laughs> with that kind of, with a woman with a gun <laughs> as a gun leg. leg. <laughs> I mean, I just Real have to say that I read somewhere that you thought of that while sitting in traffic. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's usually the shower. This time I was in traffic. Uh, it's no. usually the shower, but it, this. Yeah, usually the shower. Were you thinking of maybe killing people in traffic or? No, no. It was actually, I was trying to think of the movie. What happened was we came up with the idea of doing fake trailers to complete the night because usually when he shows a double feature, he has trailers in between. So what are we going to do now? We can't show modern trailers. So we're going to have to make our own fake trailers. And I had a trailer for a movie that I had been thinking about forever. When I first met Danny Trejo in 94, I started writing something called Machete for him because I thought I should make a whole genre with him, exploitation, And he should be a, a mexploitation star, like Charles Bronson, you know, uh -huh. or Jean-Claude Van Damme, a movie every year, just with Danny Trejo as the star. And I wrote this thing called Machete, and See, I never got a there's a trailer in the it. film starring Danny Trejo. So there's a fake trailer. I said, I got a fake trailer. I'm going to do a mexploitation movie with Danny Trejo as the star, and it's called Machete. And I, I shot it as a test for the camera test. I put it together, and, uh, and then I was starting thinking, well, what would a trailer for Planet Terror look like? Back then, I didn't have the machine gun girl yet. I had zombies, which people have seen. I had a girl with a missing leg, but I thought, what's, what's the central image? These posters, these images, I mean, these movies yeah. in the 70s, they always had a central image you would remember. Even if you never saw the movie, you would always remember something. Mm -hmm. And I needed something to sell the movie. I go, man, I got to make my own movie as sellable as Machete. And, it, and I started thinking, what could I have? And I suddenly pictured Rose McGowan you know, doing these sexy like leg kicks, but firing and blowing people's heads off, and <laughs> blasting herself over walls with a grenade launcher on her leg, and looking really, <laughs> and just the whole and and making it very grindhouse looking. And that you know, if somebody I think came up with that idea, they might make it a Terminator leg or a real sci-fi leg. Right. No, it's just going to be a stump with an ace bandage and a gun jammed in it. <laughs> just look like so 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 low budge and wrong with a beautiful girl in that, and it just looked. I, I started doing all these drawings of the action and traffic. In the traffic. And I, even, and I even called Rose and said, I got the idea for what's going to happen to your character. You're going to get a machine gun. Like, she goes, that's dope. <laughs> she said, how the hell did you come up with that? I, go, I was just stuck here in traffic. And I had to come up with an image that people remember. Oftentimes, they would come up with a poster. They'd come up with a, an image, an idea, a title, Teenage Hitchhikers. They'd come up with something and then build the movie around that. All right, Roger Corman in particular would have a poster drawn up and take it to Con or the AFM and sell the whole show. Okay, now we got to come up with something. Now we got to come up with a movie now. All right, but and that's how it happened. I'd had about 30 pages of the script and I didn't know where to go from there because once you once you bring the zombies out, how do you even explain them or anything? How do you end those movies? They always get lame from that point on. But once I had the machine gun girl, I thought, okay. She's someone who's got to start off like as a go-go dancer, who loses her leg, she hates her life, and she's got to turn into this almost, you know, messiah figure by the end that leads people to the promised land or something. She has to the Harriet Tubman character. of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> With a machine gun leg. With a machine gun leg. <laughs> We're going to deliver the goods, whatever, you know, might not be your version of the goods, all right, but they will be delivered, all right. Uh, but... <laughs> I think they become your version. They become of the your goods. version, hopefully. You don't know uh, what your version of the goods yeah. is until you see them. Right. <laughs> uh, exactly. And so the thing about it was, I had just got you know, as I'm basically, uh, I just got through watching all the slasher films all over again. Uh, hey, right when all Rob the slasher films, like from the beginning of time. No, well, you know, from like from <laughs> okay, star starting with Black <laughs> Christmas by Bob Clark in 1974 and going to maybe Sleepaway Camp. The thing that makes slasher films so great is they're all the same. Right. All right. 
<laughs> you know, you can make broad statements about the genre and be right because they're so similar. The location changes, the environment, maybe the killer changes, the, his weapon maybe changes, but there's a, there's a, the structure is in gold, other than, is in stone, excuse me, I'm, you know, gold for me, it's stone for other people. <laughs> uh, stone for the other people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, we won't even go into that. <laughs> so I realized, okay, wait a minute, I can't just do that, all right? Um, because uh, that's, that's, that's actually what people accuse me of doing, and I don't do that. All right? So that would just be too self-reflective. So I have to approach a slasher film the way I approached a heist film in Reservoir Dogs, and that is take what I want from it, but then be inspired and go my own way and give you something different. Uh, I remember, like, I always drove. I drove around for like a long time in a Geo Metro, which kind of looked like it was red and looked like a little Coke can. All right, and was about crushed as, Coke can. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm about as safe as driving around in a Coke I remember can. Remember that right? car. <laughs> and um, so the thing is, that finally, I'm like, you know what? I, it'd be kind of like a drag if I died in a car crash today. All right, so um, I, I got a Volvo. You know, I thought it was safe, and then. But I talked, I brought, just brought that up to somebody involved in movies, and they said, and this was literally 10 years ago, they said something to the effect of, well, you know, if, you know, buy any car you want, give it to a stunt team, pay them $10,000, and then they can, uh, they'll reinforce it, and, and you, know, you gotta make it death proof. You know, it's like it gets into some big horrible crash, but the driver it's of fine. the car is gonna be just fine. Just reinforced in it's ways. Just reinforced, there's roll bars in there, and, mm. and you know, they're tied down, so like they can't move a muscle, so when it happens, you know, they're safe. That's yeah. how they do stunts, you know? Right. And, um, and literally, it's a line in the movie, but it's, you know, right. you get a car like that, you drive a, into a brick wall, brick wall going 100 miles an hour just for the experience. All right. so, uh, <laughs> so then I thought, oh, well, you know, that could work for a slasher film. Like, a, it's a, that's a stunt thing, so maybe the guy's a deranged stuntman and he's a sexual pervert, because you know, there is a class of, there's a thing out there of people who are fetishized sexually about car crashes, and that's his thing, is to stalk young women and find a female posse and kind of get their modus operandi. They know when they go out drinking and they get drunk and they smoke pot and they do all this shit. He doesn't do anything. He crashes into them, they die, he lives through it, they were fucked up, he wasn't, they had booze and drugs in their system, he didn't, it's a mistake. And he right. moves to a next state and does it again 14 months later. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> the brilliant. Don't try that at home, I know it's yeah, already Yeah, exactly, you guys. Yeah, I'm saying that like that's a good idea, all right? <laughs> Eureka! If it had been a snake, it had bit me. <laughs> <laughs> but like when, when you say that, can you see the whole movie in your head before you even write a word? Not 100%. It was just, it was, and this, here was the big deal for me that made me so excited about it was, it's been since Reservoir Dogs that I've kind of come up with an idea, like right now. Uh -huh that I would have to work on and then just sit down and look at a blank piece of paper and fill it out. Even Pulp Fiction, like the, the Mia Wallace, uh, uh, Vincent Vega story I'd had in my mind for a long time. Kill Bill I'd had in my mind for a long, Kill Bill was like my planet terror. I'd even written 30 pages years before. Even Jackie Brown, I had read it earlier and thought about making a movie and kind of worked out how I would do such a thing. Hmm. This is the first time since Reservoir Dogs that I came up with an idea and sat down and pounded it out and got to the end. And I never would have done that if Robert hadn't come up with a whole grindhouse idea and let's do this. I would have, hey, that's a good idea, but I would have pissed fired around and thought about it, done something else, and maybe eventually got back to this. It's, this made me sit down and write the beginning and then all the way to the end. So I was really excited about that. And, and, and the project, even the, the script itself, forget the project the script itself was infused by the energy of like coming up with it right now and, and plowing through do you have a, a thing like Robert where you're in traffic or you're in the shower where you get divine inspiration my room like that is I have a record room in my house uh, vinyl and, records. yes vinyl records and it's all set up like a little used record store and there's bins and they're broken down they're into bins? category yeah like like in a you know, i love that oh, that's cool bins. very cool yeah. do you have markers oh yeah yeah they have the little plastic dividers this is uh -huh. british invasion psychedelic r b 70s soul rap you know and all that kind of that's stuff. excellent <laughs> folk music and cowboy songs <laughs> 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 children's records okay <laughs> 
And, uh, uh, Movie themes. Exactly. Oh, oh, oh the soundtrack know. section has its own section, all right? It's not with the other stuff. It's got its own wall, all right? <laughs> Every time I used to go into used records, I always start with the soundtrack section and then move on from there. All right. Um, so the thing is, that's my room. All right, because I just put on music and just kind of pace around and, and web spin scenes, web spin set pieces, and that keeps me going. Whenever I'm writing and I'm either I'm coming to a hard part or I need a little enthusiasm or I need a little pick-me-up, remind myself that this is a good idea, then I've already usually probably come up with at least a couple songs I want to use in the movie, even if it's just the opening credit sequence. And then I go into my room and listen to the music and kind of pace around and it like gets me plugged in again. Okay, I got the beat of the movie now again. Now I am feeling it again. All right, and then I go back down and start writing again. And when you finished writing, did you did you compare notes or did you just work oh, we separately? Just, ha just handed each, each other scripts. Each, each other scripts. You didn't hand each other scripts. And you cast him in the in your movie. I didn't think of that till later. I mean, I, I was trying to find someone for this part. Uh, it was an important part. It was called um, Rapist Number One. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually an important part. It is an important part. <laughs> in fact, Ray Liotta was actually interested in doing it, but he got this show that he was doing, and he, right. and he couldn't do it. I thought, well, shit. If I can't get Ray, I'm gonna get Quinn. <laughs> exactly. uh, we were reading around the table. Everyone just, the actors just sort of read the script out loud so we can hear it, and I'll act a few parts out of whoever's not there. And I said, Quentin, can you take rapist number one and rapist number three, and I'll do rapist number two. And when he read it, as soon as he started reading it, everyone just started, got real quiet, because he was doing it in the voice of Richie from Dust exactly. Till Dawn. Exactly, I was going to say, Dust Till Dawn. And he was really creepy sounding, and I thought, yeah. oh my God, wait. It'd be great to have, this is like Richie's brother. He should have Richie <laughs> show up again. Yeah. And, uh, and so he, he, uh, I got him to do it because he wasn't acting anymore. He didn't feel like acting, but he heard the reaction of everyone there in the room, and so he's like, oh, "Maybe for this one." Yeah, it, was, <laughs> it almost seemed like a setup—a very nice, pleasant, <laughs> gratifying to hear setup. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> You get to be rapist number one. That's well, what everybody well, waits to hear. I actually, yeah, you know, it's rapist number one. All right. Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry. Uno rapist, rapist number one. <laughs> I'm the top of the heap. <laughs> the number one rapist. Yeah. Uh, I actually just remember reading it, and then like Marley Shelton of all people was the one directly across from me in the t uh, uh, in the table, and she has these the hugest eyes on the planet Earth anyway, like a Japanese yeah. anime. All right, well they just got even bigger. What was it? Well, you know, I think your best performance is in Dust Till Dawn. Oh, hands down, I definitely agree with that. And what was it? What did you? What was it like to direct? Mr. Not that Chair? it was so great. It's, it's just the director. best. You, you were. I thought he was great. I thought he it's was great. It's better than all the other shit I did. That's not true. <laughs> I thought it was great. I kind of like you in Four Rooms too. Yeah, Four Rooms. I thought he was really great. I thought you were really good. In four I think rooms. he's really great in this, and he he is an important part of the the movie. He delivers some of the biggest screams and laughs, and <laughs> it's yes, a great but, character. And so, gags. Uh, but, but what is that? It's, great to, it's great to direct him because he comes in, he doesn't come in as a director. I mean, I've directed a lot of people who are also directors, actors who also direct, and they always the same way. They don't come in and try to, you know, direct themselves. They, they want to be there as an actor. And Quentin came in already with a performance idea in mind, and so a lot of it is just being a good audience, being a director. Right. And, uh, and knowing how you're shooting it, figuring out what part of it you're going to use and whether you've got it or not. And a lot of times I'd pull them aside and show them, since I shoot digital, I can really show them on a big screen what I like. And we'd come over and I'd show them, this is the take I'm going to use. We'd just be laughing at this. Like, oh, break it off. Anything he says that just really cracks you up. You know it's going to be a classic. It gives them much more confidence. Right. And they go back in and they just, they know they're already putting the flag in a performance and they just keep nailing it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a cool thing to be able to show them what they're doing and, uh, and showing, you how, showing them how you're going to use it. And that's where being like your own editor comes in handy because you can tell them, I'm using this. Are you okay with that? And if they're not, they'll go do it better. Usually they, they like what they see. But people, and somewhere I read that you not only edit it on the set, but you also like lay in a musical track. Yeah, usually they so music. That... You usually be scoring along with, with your guitar, or in this case, I use a lot of John Carpenter music as, as inspiration to play on top because it's that it's... kind of. Yeah, in, yeah, in particular, the, 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 the theme to Escape from New York, all right? He kept laying in there all the time. It was like, I felt like it was like John Carpenter was on the set or something. You, wow. you, you felt so like you were watching a movie. The picture, yeah. It was like you were wow. in a movie theater watching the daily and you wow. just shot the scene. I would do that after I'd find the take I'd want. I'd have them, okay, everybody come sit down. I'm going to show you what you just did and this is what I'm going to use to make sure we're cool with it and I'd put the music on and, and already be mixing it in and they'd be like that's incredible though I oh, mean we're, it must we're, we're seeing it come to life already and they, and they guess everybody has more confidence they just feel like I'm, I'm a director I don't know how he does that <laughs> I, I kind of don't want to know I, I like not knowing the magician's tricks but I don't know how the fuck you do something like that <laughs> how did you guys first meet let's uh, start with that magic moment 
I heard about Quentin because my movie El Mariachi was out in 92 at the film festivals, and my agent had seen his movie at, I guess, Sundance. Yeah. Because then I was going to tell you ride with mine. He goes, there's a guy that I think you're really going to like his stuff. He did a movie called Reservoir Dogs. His name's Quentin Tarantino. And I said, uh, well, I'll probably see him on the festival circuit. I went to tell you ride. Uh, he wasn't there. He was somewhere else. I saw his movie for the first time. So when I got to Toronto in 1992, the Toronto Film Festival, we met. And, 92 uh, was with El Mariachi? El Mariachi, Reservoir Dogs, uh -huh. both violent movies with guys dressed in black. It just, uh -huh. it just happened to be. And uh, <laughs> we ended up having to do a lot of panel discussions yeah. there at the film festival together about violence in the movie in the 90s, even though it was only 92. <laughs> we're suddenly <laughs> brought in and we're like the authorities because we're bringing this violent cinema to the art crowd. Yeah. Yeah. It was me, Robert, the man bite dog guys, and uh, the romper stomper guy. Stomper all right, we, we were at, like we were like we're a the gang usual suspects. Yeah, the gang of just to throw rocks at. You know, these are the guys who are going to corrupt cinema, and they were right. And but, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> he actually gave me. There's a uh, there was a famous uh, art theater uh, uh, art house in Austin, Texas, the Dobie. The Dobie. Yeah. There's three screens there, and there was this big out, you know, outrage in Austin because it just so happened that the three movies playing in the three theaters were Man Bites Dog, El Mariachi, <laughs> and Reservoir Dogs. It's like, oh my God, our art cinema has been invited, invaded by this violent bullshit. <laughs> and Robert actually took a photo we of the marquee, photo, and right. I actually still have it on my refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what happened was, usually you meet somebody like this at a film festival. You know, I went through high school and grade school wanting to make movies, and, and no one else in my class did that. Nobody else thought like that. You're like the oddball. Then you go meet another oddball mm -hmm. at the film festival. You go, right. man, we would have been best friends all yeah. through school. And then usually you don't see that person again. But what was weird is after we got along at the film festival and he said, oh, you're going to like my next movie. I'm writing uh, something called Pulp Fiction. Are you really going to like it? I remember him telling me that. I went back to Columbia Pictures where I was writing Desperado and he ended up having an office right. two doors down from me because he was writing Pulp Fiction originally for TriStar. For TriStar. Right. So we hung out all the time there at the studio, at the studio a lot with him reading me pages from Pulp Fiction, me showing him stuff from Desperado and storyboards. And, and then I ended up casting him in Desperado. And that's when the re relationship started up working together. This is our sixth collaboration now. So we've I know, been- it's amazing. And, and, it's it, really- it, it truly is a situation where we just- Like we the would, 70s. We would, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We would truly, you know, because you know, he was my audience and I was his audience and everything. And he was like the perfect sounding board. So we really would like, you know, inspire each other. To go further, to like, you know, oh, oh, this, oh, Robert's gonna love this, all right? I'd read him this, and and then he he come up with like, oh man, that's gonna be so cool, I mean, the greatest <laughs> gunfight never heard. I remember that, you know, the, the silence or gunfight you uh, had at one point. <laughs> and, um, and actually, it was the Columbia, it was the Sony lot, so like Versailles. That wow. Cuban place yeah. is right across the street. So we'd like we'd, we'd web spin all day and then go to Versailles at night and eat and just talk about how we were going to take over Hollywood. <laughs> it was great to be a part of that because I remember when he finished Pulp Fiction, uh, he told me, I hadn't seen it yet, and he said, hey, I just finished my movie. He said, What do you think? He goes, I don't know. It's like, it doesn't feel like a real movie. It feels like, still feels like that thing Quentin does. And I said, Well, that's what, you know, to my buddy, I'm like, Oh, that's what's going to make it cool, you know, that it's like, from you, it's not like all that other shit. It's going to be different and all that. I don't feel bad about that. Mm -hmm. And then it goes out and does gangbuster business. And even he's surprised, like, oh, fuck. <laughs> 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 now what am I going to do? You know? Suddenly he got a better car. He's not driving that little Coke can around anymore. Yeah. He thinks, this might be it. I might have just done what I was supposed to do on Earth. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to exactly. die. I didn't feel so indestructible anymore. Right? <laughs> Before I actually did Pulp Fiction, I was like, hey, man, God put me on here to do some shit, man. He's going to let me die in some fucking earthquake or car crash. And then I did Pulp Fiction. You know what? Maybe I I just did what I was supposed to do. And <laughs> dramatically speaking, taking me out of the game right now would be a very good dramatist move, all right? Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a vovo. What, one of the great regrets of my life is that I was not at the Cannes Film Festival when Pulp Fiction won the Palme d'Or. That's the and only regret I have about being in Cannes that year is that you weren't there. Oh. oh. But I wonder what it was like for you at the festival, because it was a surprise. People act like now it was a foregone conclusion, but it was really not the thing that everybody thought was necessarily going to sweep or take over. It was different. You know, it was all set up for, for Kislovsky's Red to win. Uh-huh. All right. No. Very can. Yeah, and the thing about it was, and also, I mean, you know, he had, he had done a trilogy, and there was going to be his last thing. He had done blue, white, and red, and, and 
blue won the Venice Film Festival, and I think white won the Berlin Film Festival, so he's like having a cinematic trifecta going on here. <laughs> you know? uh, and wasn't he quite... And it's terrific. It's the best of the three. It's also right? a good movie. So, it's a really terrific movie. So, um, you know, we go, you know, we go into it, and, and you know, the only thing I didn't want to win, I didn't want to win Best Screenplay. I thought that would have been a fuck you award. All right. Uh, kind so, of like at the Oscars. Yeah. Well, no, I won Best know, Screenplay. That know, wasn't a fuck I, you there. All right. Uh, it's not. I like my no, gold wait, little wait, man. Wait, wait, All right. Wait, wait. <laughs> I don't mean fuck you. <laughs> and I'm thrilled that you won. But you know, you are the person. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you are the person who taught me that whoever wins Best Screenplay is a film that should have won Best should've, Picture. Should have yeah. won Best <laughs> Picture. Well, it it is. I'm not even saying that about me. It's, look, they just, I mean, when it comes to Academy Awards, it's the hippest branch in the Academy Award. Right. Was, that's why I'm right. in that branch. It's the hippest branch. And they, but that's not kind of the way it is at the Cannes Film Festival. They kind of throw in the bone, all right? And, um, and so the thing about it was, you know, I, I, I thought that, like, the cast was going to just win some big jury award as an ensemble, or maybe I'd get, like, second prize or something like that. And so I'm sitting there, and, and and I said, I'd already gone to Sundance with Reservoir Dogs, and I didn't win shit, all right? <laughs> not with Reservoir, with dogs, all right? So the thing about it, though, is like, well, you know what? I'm not going to sit there and, like, give them the permission to bum me out. It's like, <laughs> I, I got to know I'm going to get something if I go to this thing, or I'd rather just not go, and then it doesn't feel so bad. Right. And so then I was, I'm like, hey, Jill Jacob has got to tell Harvey that I've won something, or I'm on a fucking plane <laughs> at 10 in the morning. <laughs> And then she was like, oh, Harvey, he cannot go. He cannot go. <laughs> Taking that as a good sign, all right? <laughs> so I go, and, I, and I, I sit down at the awards thing, and I keep, as the, I'm sitting right next to Harvey, all right? And you know, as the awards are going on or going on, I'm like, oh, I didn't win that one. I didn't win this one. I didn't win this one, all right? And so now I'm thinking it's either going to be this, audio, you know, this jury award for the entire cast or a second prize. And then certain up, second prize is a tie. Okay, here we go. Nope, it was two other movies. Oh my God. And now, it's now the Palm Door. And then Harvey, and I've never talked to him this way before in my entire life. <laughs> Harvey goes, oh my God, you've won the Palm Door. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, no, you just won the Palm Door. Shut the fuck up. And then Clint Eastwood said, and the winner is Pulp Fiction, all right? And me and Lawrence jumped up in the air like we just won a football game. <laughs> Lawrence Bender, the producer. <laughs> so that's what that was like yes. for me. And now, to get for the, it, and to for get the get rest it. of us, yes. it was like, you know, one of your friends won, that, especially a movie that, you know, he did have some self-doubt about at first when he first finished. Right. He goes, this isn't even a real movie. And then that wins, and you're like, Wow, we can make anything now. Because he yeah, comes back exactly. and he goes, uh, That's what I mean, this, yeah. this movie, he had a script that people just kept passing on. His first thing he wrote, From Dust Till Dawn, that was like, they're like, this is, you know, it's like half of one movie, then it turns into a vampire movie. It makes no sense. After he won the Palme d'Or, it's like two movies in one. It's perfect. <laughs> it's so new and so original, and it's two movies in one. It's like, you have no idea it's going to turn into a vampire. Sure, you can make it, you know. So it was a party for everybody. And people sometimes mistakenly say, do you guys compete a lot? Because you're, and it's like, no, we actually enjoy each other's yeah. success. And, and it's like our success, too. Yeah, you know, get a part of that. The only time I've ever felt competitive with Robert during the in, our entire career was when I was coming out with Kill Bill volume, was it one or two? Was it was one, one, because one, I had one, just yeah, done yeah. Spy Kids yeah, in the yeah, summer. Yeah. The, Spy Kids 3. Had, like opened to number one. Mm -hmm. Then a few months later, I had Once Upon a Time Mexico come out, which I had done years before. Yeah. They were finally released. Also number one. That opened to number one. But I think it was like yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. So Robert had two number one movies in one within year. Within two months. Yeah. Two months. And so it's like within like you know like a you know like literally maybe a month and a half after Once Upon a Time in Mexico opened up, which opened up at like twenty eight million. All right. Uh, uh, I was opening up a Kill Bill Volume 1. Which he'd been working his ass off of for yeah. like three years. Yeah, the closest thing to a comp... I, was, I did want to beat his opening weekend, all right? <laughs> I didn't get close. Right? I was 22 million, all right? But that was the only time I just... just I wanted to beat his opening weekend. That was the only time I was ever competitive with him. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but you did, if you think about it, because you only made one movie. They split it up. Mm -hmm. 
And if you count both your opening weekends, you probably made like four. Well, if I count both of them. But even the second one didn't beat yours, all right? It was 25. But together, I'm saying. And that's one of the things we talk about in this. Well, together, then I could count Spike Kids, and I really didn't do it. Uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That puts me even further in a hole. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, I'll quit right there. But now you're and together. Now what's cool about this now you're is together. with Kill Bill, and that's what the thing we say is that the studio is really you know, open to new ideas. They do, you know, their studio. They like to make money when they can. And I said, this is movie is kind of payback in a way because, you know, with Kill Bill, they sold you one movie for the price of two. <laughs> On this movie, we're giving you two movies for the price of one. And they allowed us to do that. And yeah. it's a really great deal. I'm really yeah, excited. Yes. Okay, before we ask questions to the audience, I have, I have one more question, which is, in your movie, because you're such an incredible student of film, you have one of the best car chases I've ever seen and car chases I've seen. <laughs> but I love your sort of dissection of the art of the car chase. And I wondered if you could speak a bit about how the car chase, you know, how you sort of, in your student of film brilliant way, kind of analyzed what people are compelled by when they see a car chase and how they've changed. And well, you know, it's, it's funny because, um, yeah, I, mean, I love the idea of, of, of taking these great, you know, uh, set pieces or, you know, classic pieces of cinema, whether it be the car chase or the kung fu fight or whatever, and throwing my hat in the ring mm -hmm. and, and doing my take on them. And I, I get to be both a student where I get to soak in everything that's come before me and then try to take it to another place. Because if I'm going to do it, I want to do one of the best ones ever made or there's no point throwing my hat in that ring. Um, but the car chase is really kind of interesting when you put it under a microscope and look up at it. Because it's actually one of the things, if you understand editing a little bit, you look at a car chase, you can kind of see how it was done if you start putting a practical brain to it. But, um, you know, there used to be a time, you know, in, you know, like from Bullet on in the 70s and deep through the 80s, even into the early 90s, even with stuff like, you know, uh, uh, Terminator 2 and, and uh, Basic Instinct, that uh, you'd hear a film had a really cool car chase and you ran to the theater to see it. And you'd see it and it was worth the whole wait to see this car chase. And, and even when it wasn't as good as the other ones, at that moment it seemed like the best car chase ever made, all right? You, maybe you get out, maybe it wasn't as great as this one or that one, but at the moment you're like, man, that was hot. But then, you know, again, filmmaking has changed sometimes for the better, sometimes not for the better. And one of the things that has happened is I haven't seen what I would call a car chase in a long time, even though a lot of movies have supposedly car chases. I live and die in L.A. Yeah, uh, yeah, live and die is a great car chase. One, there's like CGI cars now, which just takes the whole piss out of everything. All right. The first time I actually saw a CGI car crash in a movie, is a movie called Along Came a Spider, and I go, a CGI car crash? They've been crashing cars for a hundred years in movies. You think anybody's going to get off with some computer shit on a car crash? <laughs> you were just too lazy. To, it was more expensive to do it with CGI, for Christ's fucking sake. Um, but then... <laughs> It's also, but you know, it, but it's also, you know, it's the whole video editing system too. You do a car crash and they put 15 cameras to cover the crash. And you know what? Hell, fuck, 10 of those shots are gonna be great. So they need to use a piece of all 10 of them. And now there's no any forward momentum. Everything's too goddamn cutty. Uh, you have no sense of location. You know, have sense of the geography. You definitely have no sense of speed. All right, forget the fact that they're probably over crank, under cranking the goddamn thing anyway. All right, um, you know, so the thing about it is, yeah, it can be thrilling, but it's not the chase that you used to get. And so that was definitely, my idea was, you know, no CGI involved in the car chase, all right? And not only that, one of my lead actresses is a, is a stunt woman, and she's, she's the lead amazing. actress in the Zoe film, Bell Zoe Bell. Bell. And so she's really doing every single solitary second of it. Not even if it's her hand, it's her hand, all right, holding on to something. If it's her foot on a bumper, it's her foot. You know, it's the whole thing is her. And no undercranking whatsoever. We existed between 70, 80, 90, and 100 miles an hour every single time. And just to put that in proper perspective, if the camera's ever in front of the car, if the car's going 100, we're going 110, all right? Wow. To shoot it. Wow. But the thing that was really also kind of interesting was to even break down the car chase, even, you know, forget about the ones I don't like now, just to break, up, break them down inside the ones that did work. Because it's like the American car chases that we grew up loving in the 70s, like the driver or bullet or French connection, um, 
you know, they were location based. That was part of it. The fact that the chasing is happening in downtown LA at night, you know, where it turns into a ghost town in the driver, or even like colors, all right? The fact that it's through Watts, that's a, that's a deal, that's a thing, all right? Um, but then once the Australians got involved in it, they re revolutionized car chases. And I'm not just talking about Mad Max. I mean, you can't make a 14-year-old girl coming of age movie in Australia without having a car chase break out at some point. <laughs> But the thing that they did that was so great was, you know, location oriented. It's the fucking outback, all right? Everything looks like this fucking same, all right? So, uh, uh, so they, you know, all of a sudden they didn't have drive by shots. Everything you were in the chase, you were with the cars constantly, every second. It was like pussy to put a car off the side of the road and have, you know, they were with them. And so I wanted to actually do that. I wanted to, you know, do the Australian style and bringing in, but then there's even one more dif you know, difference, and that is who's chasing who, right. all right? Most of the time, it's the, it's the protagonist is being chased by a bunch of cops, you know, like in Blues Brothers or something like that. You're being chased by somebody. But the most exciting chases, the ones that you're, you're on the edge, you see, yeah, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, all right, is when you, the protagonist is chasing the person and you want that person to get caught. That's French Connection. That's what makes French Connection so, because you want Popeye Dole to get that bastard. Exactly. All right? <laughs> and those were always more emotionally connected when you were following the hero. Why well, have both <laughs> in my... <laughs> I have the girls being chased, I have the girls chasing. So I tried to hit all those emotional bases. All right, let's take a question. Let's start with the left side. This question is for Quentin. I was wondering, uh, in the late 80s, when you were wanting to be a filmmaker and you were struggling, uh, and you hadn't yet written, or of course directed Reservoir Dogs, how did you get yourself through that period? Did you try to ramp up your writing by the end of the 80s, or what got you through it? Well, you know, it's... Um, and what got me through it was kind of also what held me back at the exact same time, but it all worked out well, was um, I got a, 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 you know, I started working at this video store, was pretty much what you're talking about around that time, and, and it was great at first, because I'd, I'd always hated day jobs and stuff, and so I got a day job, and it ended up being pretty good, but admittedly, I was there for five years. At a certain point, it was a narcotic, all right? I didn't have to keep pursuing my dreams, because, mm -hmm. You know, it's not what I want to do, but it's sort of kind of close. And if I didn't have an artist soul burning in me, I could have made myself happy with that. I could, if I, if I didn't have an uh, artist soul burning to get out, I could have, Stay you know, there. walked backwards a couple steps and just done that. And that would have been a, a fulfilling, well, to anybody else, it would have been a fulfilling life. It wouldn't have been for me because I would have known I would have had something to say that I didn't get a chance to say. Um, but it did put me to sleep for a while and and I've always just thought I mean what really got it got everything kind of truly going for me you could point out a lot of different things but the bottom line is the fact that I realized that the, even the group of people I hung around with um, they were all great 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 fellas and great gals but you know I was easy for me to think that I was doing a lot because I was doing more to try to move myself forward than they were but you know <laughs> That's not, yeah, I'm, yeah, okay, I'm a big fish in a puddle. So what, all right? They're not doing anything, all right? Uh, so yeah, I'm doing more than them. But um, I realized that actually I need to get my ass out to Hollywood and meet other people who are, you know, like in my category or, or working a little higher. And, and I should be the weakest link in my chain. <laughs> that I have, and that'll make me be stronger, it'll make me run faster. I mean, like an analogy I've always used is, all right, if you run uh, the 100 yard dash with a, a people that can't run as fast as you, yeah, you'll win, hands down, you know that. But if you run with people much faster than you, all right, yeah, you might come in last every single time, but your time will be better because they're making you run all the faster. They're making, they're making you dig down just a little bit more. It doesn't matter that you won. Your time is faster. And that's what I knew I had to do. I had to get out of Loserville and throw myself into a place where, like, this is what the fuckers do for a living. 
Hi. Um, in your iconoclast, you talk about the, the them in the way is like, who are they to tell you you yeah. can't do something? And in Rebel Without a Crew, you talk about the difficulty of even being able to edit your own movie with the studio. Mm -hmm. However, with Bob and Harvey Weinstein, you seem to have found a good relationship. Can you describe the balance at all between director and producer and your circumstance of what it should be, where you can have your creative freedom, yet they still have some financial security? One of the main things was, I realized even with Mariachi and Desperado, um, was if you give this, by keeping the cost down, that's one of the reasons why I still multitask so much, is because I get that sort of feeling from the whole crew, is everyone does more than they probably should, but it keeps the budget down to where you can deliver something that looks like a huge movie that the studio can sell like a big movie, but it doesn't cost a lot. So in exchange for that, they let you do what you want because you're not spending very much. The movie can tank at the box office and it's still going to turn a profit to where they're not going to tell you who needs to star in that movie. They're not going to tell you what cuts you need to make. They basically let you try anything. When I took them the idea for Sin City, that's full of no's. I mean, you shouldn't do a movie that's black and white, that's anthology, that's all voiceover. I mean, that's three no's right there. It's like three no-no's. Um, <laughs> but they knew that it wasn't going to cost anything and that it would attract a big cast and they could sell it like a huge movie but it wouldn't cost any more than the Spy Kid movies cost it. So they, they, they let you do it. They're not going to tell you, oh, no, it's got to be color, or no, it can only be one story instead of three, and no voiceover. So you get that kind of creative freedom. And we're here, we're making two movies for the price of a Sin City. <laughs> you, they, what are they going to tell you? So you know, we have a great relationship with them where they will make this movie, even though it's low budget for most studios, it's their biggest movie. It's their tent pole. So that's a great relationship we have with them, is that they take it and they'll go and they'll market it like it's their biggest movie, which in a way it is, because they don't, they don't spend a lot of crazy money on their movies anyway. So it's been a really good relationship with them. I mean, you know, to actually have them back us on this, this project, I mean, we know what would work, but the truth be told, actually, and, you know, just recently we've seen it with audiences and it's actually been completely delivering and the truth be told, it's only now that we're out of the woods, at least as far as audience participation-wise is concerned, that I'm realizing how chancy this really was, it could, <laughs> how it easily could not have worked. Um, but you know, uh, but you know, at the, at the same time, the, the truth of the matter is, if you're really going to be an artist with your own voice and you want to do different things and try, you know, not the standard thing, then you know, the biggest balancing act you have to pull isn't really even being a good filmmaker. We'll just say that you have that, is that balancing act between sticking to your vision, sticking to your voice, but not being some asshole who can only hear the sound of his own voice. You know, and that's, I mean, it's all right there. That's it, you gotta be able to listen to people, you gotta be able to hear what they're saying, but you also can't just, I mean, when, the, when the going gets tough, uh, not give up on your vision. Do you guys find Five it easier uh, to take risks, either financially or creatively, when collaborating, when like the other one's there, or is it just the same? Do you guys just do what you feel is right? I think in both mine and Robert's case, whether it be this movie or anything we've done by ourselves, it's like there's not a tremendous leap of faith we're asking anybody because it's right there in the script. Everything we say we're going to do is kind of right there, and it's you know it, it's it we can talk about it you know, and if I can talk about it to Harvey and Bob, then I can talk about it on a talk show, and they get it, then I can talk about it on a talk show, and the audience will get it. I mean, I mean, I know what you. You do understand things about each other that yeah. I think it's the sound only dogs can hear. I mean, yeah, I really, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I do think there's a kind of. I mean, that's why I used the word collective unconscious before. It's like yeah. you were twins separated. At, yeah. You know, no, I think ideas are definitely better or... when they're together. I mean, like, I, I had the idea for a double feature, but it wasn't until I brought Quentin into the mix that it turned into the Grindhouse experience. Right. I mean, it's a exponentially bigger. And um, sometimes he'll send me something to score for him, for instance, and he'll be so excited because it's something that he wouldn't have been able to get just from another composer, because I know him very well. Or edit this section for me, because I shot it in But it's not that you know style. each other so well, you also know film so well, so that if you say it's like X or Y, I mean, you know, like the movies you've named tonight, a lot of people actually haven't seen those films, but you've <laughs> all seen, you, you haven't know, seen Candy Snatchers? Candy Snatchers. <laughs> you know what? Even I haven't seen Candy Snatchers. So <laughs> this is the benefit of knowing Quinn, is I hear him say something like that, and I go, I haven't seen that. Can we go watch it up at your house and have a whole screening with a double feature and throw some trailers in? Sure, come on up tomorrow night. Oh, there you go, my night's set. There, but, you know, actually, but what, what you're saying is actually correct, is about the fact that I wouldn't have just come up with this idea on my own. I literally had to come up with my half a grindhouse. Right. And that 
put me in the direction to come up with the death proof car. And then I actually didn't just gestate on it that someday I'll put it in the incubator and we'll see if it comes out five years from now. I actually had to, because Robert's waiting for it, I actually had to you know, come, you know, come up with the goods right now. And I remember as I was doing it, and I was like liking it and falling more and more in love with it, I go, I never would have done this without Robert. Right. Uh, I, was, I was here in June uh, when Lynn hosted Bob and Harvey, and I was able to ask a question about oh. you two guys and what was the common denominator of working with you successfully. I was wondering if you could share a quick, uh, mm. what's your favorite thing about working with these guys? Well, I have a lot of things, but there actually is one thing in particular that, that kind of sets them apart from everybody else. Uh, is Harvey and Bob are the, they are the last true, like, throwback to the, the moguls. All right, that used to run their studios. All right, if you go and have a meeting with any, but not that I have ever done that. All right, but uh, I have. <laughs> if you go and 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 have a meeting at Fox, Paramount, just pick your goods. All right, you know, whoever. All right, you're, you know you're dealing with somebody who has been hired and they have a job. And even if they're the president, they have a job. And they will have that job for as long as they have that job. And then they'll be gone and somebody else will have that job and they'll be independent producers. All right. Harvey and Bob make, can actually, they're, they're gamblers. They can make a decision based on their gut and they are the guys. They're the, they don't have a job, it's their studio. And, and I've, actually, people have come up to me before, and they said, you know, uh, could you show this to Miramax? I th you know, I'd like to get in with Miramax. And I go, you know what? I can give it to them to watch. And they might like it, and they may, may not like it. But I can tell you this about Miramax. OK, Weinstein Company. Weinstein All Company. right. Uh, I can tell you this about these guys. If everybody in the studio loved it, if Harvey and Bob don't like it, you'd be better someplace else. <laughs> because it's all about them. And uh, and that's what uh, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with accountants. I want to deal with Louis B. Fucking Mayor. I want to deal with Jack Fucking Warner. All right. And uh, here it is. I hate this. I like that. All right. And I'm lucky. Harvey likes my stuff. It's like that fucking simple. If he and didn't Bob. like my stuff. I'd be somewhere else, all right? I'm lucky because I'm lucky Bob likes my stuff. <laughs> I think Bob likes your stuff, too. And Harvey likes your stuff, too. Okay, one more question, and then Harvey and Bob. Then Harvey and Bob are going to ask yeah. me a question. I'm so excited. <laughs> Hi, um, this question is actually for the both of you. I was just wondering, um, when you experience moments of self-doubt, how do you approach getting out of that dark place? Good question. You fear you. forward. Excellent question. You fear forward always because that's when you know you're doing something right is when you have a lot of self-doubt and you go, maybe this is the time I'm doing too risky a project and maybe I should do something safer. You should fear forward or you're never going to get anywhere. Somebody was telling me, it was actually an actor, um, was about to do a short film and he'd been sending me the script saying I'm still working on it. It was a really great idea. It's kind of, you know, a big little production for him to do, big little. And then just recently I said, are you doing it? He goes, yeah, I still think I might be too ambitious. I think I'm going to do maybe something easier. I go, no, do the more ambitious one. You're going to hate yourself if you go do the easier one and you're dicking around with that. You're going to be wishing you had done the more ambitious one. Do the more ambitious thing always first. And you should always have some self-doubt. Otherwise, it's a walk in the park. It ain't worth doing. If it's that easy that you're not going to be questioning yourself constantly, am I doing the right thing? Is this too big a task for me to handle? Am I not strong enough? then you know you're in the right direction. There's a really cool book you should read called Art and Fear. You can look it up on Amazon, and it talks about that. It says, as an artist, this is, it says, as an artist, this is probably what you're thinking. I'm no good. They're going to figure me out. I'm a failure. I'll never do anything. <laughs> That's the process. That is what it means to be an artist, and everybody has that. No matter how successful you are, you're always going to feel that, and you should feel that. If you don't feel that, it's not worth doing. This movie, we thought, this probably isn't a good idea, but we feel like doing it. <laughs> we feel like doing it. Maybe this isn't the right time, but we really want to do this. And in, we just went ahead. We just know that feeling. It's like, could this be the brown idea? Yeah. Let's put the, put the pedal down. Let's go faster. And you? Well, um, you a doubt-free zone? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was <laughs> hearing your adjective in my head when you were saying that. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I actually, I, I grandiose my way out of fear. 
<laughs> if you can imagine that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a good way. You know, I, it's literally, charming. It's like, literally, it's like, okay, I'm going to do one of the greatest car chases of all time. And if I don't, I'm not as talented as I thought I was. And I will realize that there is a ceiling to my talent. Right now, I don't think there is. But if I don't do, <laughs> but if it's not one of the greatest car chases of all time, then I failed. And I, there is a ceiling to my talent. I'm not as good as I thought I was. And I said that to everybody. And was I scared? Fuck yeah. Yes. All right. I had trepidation going all the way because it's mine to fail. And it's my, and it would be a, and it's, it's failing in front of the mirror too, because I'll know if I did it or not, and I'll be like, okay, Ian, you are not as good as you thought you were. And that got me to Mount Everest. That's true. I remember one point he goes, Robert, can you imagine you and me doing this car chase together, how great it's going to be? And I'm like, hey, man, you're on your own, brother. I'm like, <laughs> I ain't going out there, man. I got five fucking kids. I'm not going to do 100 mile an hour bullshit. You want to live the vanishing point dream, buddy? Live it. <laughs> And he did it all by himself, and I'm so fucking proud of him. Okay, now. Thank you very all right, much. that was a very that good question. It. That was an excellent question. Now we got a Bob and a Harvey right, question. Bob. You have to go to the mic. Gotta go to the mic. Oh, you can say it from there. Go, the go, the oh, yeah. go to the mic. Go to the mic. Go to the mic. Go to the mic. Harvey, you get to the mic. I gotta tell you, 90% of the reason Quentin, other than wanting to see you here, is uh, I've been trying to get to Quentin uh, for the last four days. I'd say I've called him 10 times a day. <laughs> and. I don't care who you are, when Quentin is focused on other things, you're not getting through. So Quentin, I'm so glad that I was asked to ask a question. Well, now, I do, well, now I do I'll just do my phone call to you. When are we opening Germany, Quentin, and when do you want to go? That's really what I was going to ask. Yeah, that's part B. What's part A? In, in all seriousness, first of all, it's, we're so proud to be with you guys. Um, I was telling, uh, just want to tell a little a quick story. Is, um, I was uh, with Harvey, we were watching the first uh, screening that we saw, this was after the MPA, I guess, but it was the one that we saw um, in Los Angeles, one of the junket screenings, and it was just such an audience experience, and it was everything we, you had told us it would be and we had hoped it would be, and I just tapped my brother on the shoulder, and it, and it gave me that feeling again. I said, this is why we're in the business, Harvey, to support guys like this, and to just, it, I felt good of myself that I did have the guts to fly with you guys, and it just felt like that's, that's what I wanted to keep doing. I want to reiterate what Bob said about uh, being proud of these guys, and also every time we make a movie with them, we're challenged, you know, by them because what Robert talked about artists and fear, I mean, uh, these guys take the most unbelievable chances, and then it might look easy now, but marketing Pulp Fiction or marketing some of these movies, right. man, you scratch your head sometimes because it's not the one man with a gun is about to, you know, it's not that stupid ass <laughs> Hollywood movie or some guy with fucking tights running and flying up, you know, and, and, and you know, not revealing who he is and, you know, whatever, and kissing Kirsten Dunst upside down. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's really a complicated movie to make. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, take these challenges together. But I, I just want you to know, with Quentin, my relationship started with him. You know, with I, I, I read a script. A woman in my office named Trey Hoban gave me a script. It was called True Romance. So I didn't see Reservoir Dogs first. I, I didn't even know who the hell he was. It said Quentin Tarantino, and I read this script in like in an hour, and you know, I called William Morris Agency, and I bought the script, you know what I mean? And I, I n never met him, nothing. I just said, this is the most original voice I'd read, you know, you know and that's how the whole relation, then Reservoir Dogs and everything else, you know, started afterwards. And, uh, and one other thing, you know, if anybody saw the movie 300, it should have been stenciled. Special thanks yeah. to Robert Rodriguez over every frame. <laughs> I, I think Zach's an incredible director, but man, that was invented in Austin, Texas. You should have like patented that thing, Rodriguez. <laughs> I'm telling you, because it's just, be, well, Sin City 2 will blow that shit away anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely true. There is a question. Harvey, I think you have a question, though. I, I do have a question. Quent <laughs> Quentin, what's next on the oh. agenda? Oh, what's next, Quentin? Oh, gosh. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, uh, the next thing I have to do, is I've been uh, writing this World War II film for a while. Uh, it's called Inglorious Bastards. And <laughs> my, my dirty dozen. Which it's, it, it, like, 
it's not really not that anymore. It's, it's my big spaghetti Western set with World War II iconography. If there was a, 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 a subtitle to the movie, in fact, there is a subtitle to the movie, all right? Uh, <laughs> and it, it is Once Upon a Time in Nazi Occupied France, all right? So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, actually, the reason it's like, it's like that is my next Mount Everest, and I almost need to do that so I can see the other mountain. I can't see any other big mountain. I need, I need to do that so that's my next big mountain and so I can be the filmmaker I'll be who's done it. And then I'll have other horizons to conquer, but right now that's the one. Well, on that exciting note, <laughs> I think we have to say tonight. Thank you so much. For Thank you very much. Everybody, thanks for coming out. Why didn't he enter?